Welcome to Chapter 18. This is our last chapter of the semester. Hooray, you've gotten here. It's very exciting. Okay, today we're going to talk about treating substance use disorders. Now, I'll be clear. We're going to talk about this briefly because you can have an entire class on treating substance use disorders. There are entire classes at this university on this type of thing. Okay, we're going to do this briefly. Treatment. Hundreds of thousands of Americans undergo treatment for substance use disorders. A lot of people do. Okay, a variety of treatment approaches are used. And often these treatment approaches are used in combination. Okay. So there's typically behavioral or psychosocial treatments, as well as pharmacotherapies, meaning medications. Okay. Different approaches reflect different substance use problems. Okay. We will talk about each one specifically. And different theories about substance use disorders, meaning do we believe that this is a disease? Do we believe this is just a behavioral issue, a result of something that's going on, so and so? So on and so on. Okay. So treatment goals are influenced by the underlying theoretical view of addiction. If one accepts the, the view that addiction is a biological disease, then the only acceptable goal is complete and total abstinence. Okay? The idea is that this is a disease and you have no personal control over it, so if you use it all, it's not okay. Now, other people view that substance dependence represents one end of a continuum of use. And for that, we're going to teach a possible treatment goal of controlled use. That is, look, you can learn to have one beer and not have so many that you end up blackout drunk, right? So, um, and I'll be honest, in my practice, I use both of these, depending on the person. Um, I've definitely found that for some of the people I see, total abstinence is really what they want. Whether or not it's a disease, for some people that I see, um, they just really don't enjoy having one beer. That's just not fun for them. So, it's, they just either want to be completely wasted or just not at all. So, we work on the not at all. For other people, though, we really work on this controlled use, and that, that works fine for other people, okay? Um, defining treatment goals. So, how do you evaluate if a treatment program is successful? This is actually really important because a lot of treatment programs are out there based on how people feel, and they feel like it works because they think about the people that they remember it working for but don't actually do an evaluation. And when they do, sometimes you see that these programs don't actually work well for people. Um, inpatient or residential programs are lovely and wonderful, and even those don't work for a lot of people, okay? So, researchers are beginning to develop, do the, the, to develop this cost-benefit analysis. We look at the cost of treatment, and the cost of treatment is going to include things like the actual financial cost, as well as the cost of maybe missing work and things like that, versus the cost savings from increased employment and decreased crime after treatment. So the idea that if the person goes into treatment, they're actually, even though there is a cost of treatment, if they are successful in treatment, then they'll be able to work, be a part of society, uh, not go to prison, those kinds of things, okay? Now, Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, we mentioned this before. So, Alcoholics Anonymous um, came about a long time ago when, 1935, uh, a guy named Bill W. It's anonymous, right? So we don't, don't say his last name. Did I get his name right? Anyway. Um, was noticing that people who had issues with alcohol 
were treated as bad people, as though it was their fault, and just 100% they are bad people. And he and um, his buddy came up with this idea that alcoholism is a disease, and that if you have this disease, it's not your fault. But that if you follow their steps that they came up with, that you'll be able to conquer this disease by not engaging in alcohol use at all. Okay, it's a disease model of dependence. You either have it or you don't have it. You are an alcoholic or you're not an alcoholic. And once you're an alcoholic, you're always an alcoholic, even if you don't drink. Okay. Um, of note, these guys are not psychologists. They are. They did not do you know research on this to see if it works first. Um, they just kind of came up with a system that they felt would be good. And for people that want AA to work, it works. For people that don't feel like going or that are court appointed, it doesn't work. Um, it rarely works. Okay, there's, I'm sure there's a case of, you know, some cases out there where it did work, but statistically, if somebody doesn't want to go, it doesn't work. If somebody does want it to work, it typically works, okay? The idea here, of course, of this disease model is that an alcoholic is biologically different from others. So abstinence is the only appropriate goal. The disease takes away a person's control over drinking behavior. It removes the blame for the problem from the alcoholic but it does not remove the responsibility for dealing with it. And I think that part is actually pretty important, right? We say, it's not your fault that this happens, that this is what's going on with you, but it is now your responsibility to never drink again. The major approaches are these group support, or these support groups, so everybody goes, right, and they say, you know, their first name, and they say they're an alcoholic, and then they share stories. And again, this works for some people and not for others. There's also a buddy system, a sponsor that you have, right, and that is where you get somebody that you're paired up with that if you're having trouble, you can call them. Now, if you are interested in this, you, you're welcome to go to Alcoholics Anonymous groups. You can look up online and see which groups are open groups, and that's what you want to look for. Um, there are closed groups, so groups of people that have been together for a long time, and they just don't want people wandering in. Um, but you're welcome to go to these open groups and just learn about things. This also, by the way, goes for like um, Overeaters Anonymous, Gamblers Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, any of these things if you find open groups you can go to and observe, you can let them know you're observing, or you can, you know, participate, whatever works for you. Um, formal evaluations of AA have not been very positive. However, studying people who have court-ordered referrals may not be an appropriate evaluation method, right? More appropriate would be determine which types of drinkers are more likely to benefit from AA. The the issue that I have with the 12-step model and AA is not that I actually have an issue with the model. I have an issue with the fact that the research doesn't necessarily support it, um, and yet other models continuously are based on the AA model, right? Betty Ford Center, um, Hal's Den, Phoenix House, all these places are all based on the AA 12-step model, which we don't know if it actually works. So, that's my problem. Typically, in general, my issue is people going forward with something when we've already just said we're not sure if it works. Let's figure that out first, figure out if there's a better option, and then move forward. So, Another option that we have here is motivational enhancement therapy, okay? And this is going to include something called motivational interviewing. So I'll read the things on the PowerPoint and then I'll talk about it a little bit. So according to conventional wisdom, most substance users, abusers use the defense mechanism of denial. 
only when a user suffers serious consequences or hits bottom will she be ready to seek help. This is a problem. There, there is a serious problem with this idea, and some people truly believe this, that you have to hit rock bottom. Serious consequences can occur before the abuser hits bottom. And what is bottom for one person is not necessarily bottom for another person. Um, you know, one person's rock bottom might be that their kids say they won't talk to them. Another person's rock bottom is way past that where they wake up with literally a hammer stuck in the side of their head. Okay. Um, I have issues with therapists or people saying, oh, I can't wait till you hit rock bottom and then we can work. Can we, can we not work now? <laughs> can we not make, like, let's talk about this. Why do you have to go there? But, but I do understand that, that some people truly believe in this. And, you know, I'm always open to research. I'm, all, I'm always open to changing my mind if research shows that this is the way to do it. It has not yet. Okay. Motivational, motivational enhancement therapy attempts to shift the focus away from denial and toward motivation to change. Okay. So the term motivational interviewing. Um, motivational interviewing is used for a lot of things, but often for addiction. And this is where we talk to people instead of saying, you need to change, you need to do this, this is what you're doing wrong, blah, 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 that makes people just shut you out. Say so things like, well, I mean, there's got to be a reason that you're doing this, right? Like, you're not just drinking every day because it's just fun. There has to be other reasons that, that are, are or let me say this another, sorry, not just fun, but you're not drinking every day just because you want to ruin your life. But there's got to be reasons that you like doing it. Let's talk about the pros. Let's talk about the positives of you continuing this behavior. And through that, people often start saying, well, yeah, actually, I do like this. And yeah, actually, this is kind of a problem if I stop. And then we can really talk about those particular things. Also, in motivational interviewing, there's always this like pros and cons grid. And you have pros of quitting pros of maintaining your current behavior, cons of quitting, and cons of maintaining your current behavior. Sometimes some of these things overlap, but sometimes we get different things. And it's really nice for people to be able to look at it and be like, okay, here's the reality. And starting to internally, though, get themselves motivated. Um, and there's, I mean, there's a lot more to it. There's books on motivational interviewing. It works well. Um, so if this is something you're going into, do check out motivational interviewing. Now, and I wanted to talk about motivational interviewing before I went to this particular slide. There's a reason. The stages of change which is developed by a guy of the last name Prochaska, um, is often linked with motivational interviewing, and it doesn't need to be. Motivational interviewing is not the stages of change. Okay, motivational interviewing has fabulous research backup. It is a non-confrontational process of determining the abuser's current state of change and then helping the individual move forward. Now, Again, though, this is, this is the way these books that, that write about huge things talk about this, is that you have to um, determine the current state of change. You don't, okay? You can use motivational interviewing without the stages of change. Now, let's go to stages of change. I actually do want you to know these. My issues with the stages of change are that, okay, we can figure out what stage they're in, um, but we don't have research that shows that it actually like is helpful then to what we're doing. I guess we can use it to evaluate where we are. And by the way, research is still going on with this. It's still being funded pretty well. Um, I actually really like 
one of the people who is working on this, which is Prochaska, older Prochaska's daughter, lovely, wonderful person. Um, and the research just doesn't show that we need to continue on with these stages of change talking about it. But since we do, and if you ever go into this field or you go into anything, you need to know these. So I'm making you learn them. Okay, I promise it's for your own good. Um, and then maybe in 10 years, you won't, you know, it'll be a non thing. Here's the idea people find themselves in different stages of change over time. The first is pre contemplation. Within pre contemplation, the individual doesn't recognize that a problem exists. So this would be like denial, right? Okay. The next stage is contemplation. And in contemplation, the person recognizes that there's a problem, begins to consider the possibility of changing behavior, and then they move to preparation. In preparation, an individual decides to change. Hopefully, they move then to the action step. Action is the individual takes active steps toward change. Okay, and then in the maintenance phase, the individual engages in activities intended to maintain the change. Okay, and people do typically go through these stages, right? Um, but we see that sometimes people sort of fluctuate back and forth between stages. Sometimes they get to one and then they go back to, uh, you know, one, two steps before that. Um, hopefully, you know, they get to maintenance. Some people never do. Um, so I think these, these stages exist, but people fluctuate a bit more in them rather than continuously moving through them, blah, blah, blah. Okay, there's your stages of change. Prochaska. Um, contingency management. So this would be different than the AA approach. So contingency management is an approach in which individuals receive rewards for providing drug-free urine samples. Do be clear, this works. Um, value of rewards increases with consecutive drug-free samples. Clients also participate in bi-weekly skill building sessions, okay, um, to help them be successful in this. Uh, when we find that when we pay people not to use drugs, they don't use them. They stop. They find a way not to. Um, however, these programs are not very popular because you have to fund them. Somebody has to be giving the money to people to not use drugs. And there's this feeling of like, should we be giving things to somebody for not using drugs or for doing what we're already not doing? Um, and of course, politically, you can imagine this is doesn't go over so well, it does work. Okay. Um, weaknesses of the approach, cost of the rewards, it may seem unfair. However, the therapeutic workplace, and that is demonstrates that the drug using behavior may be replaced with employable skills, and that's when they have to go to the skill building sessions also. Okay. Moving on to cognitive behavioral therapy. So in CBT for addictions, we're using cognitive behavioral, or sorry, cognitive therapy and behavioral skills training. So the individual learns to identify and change behaviors that could lead to relapse, such as like don't hang out with your friends that are shooting heroin if you don't want to shoot heroin. Don't hang out with your friends that are going to go get shit-faced if you don't want to be completely wasted. Um, finding ways to make things feel different. Um, one of the things that I often suggest, and this seems kind of silly, is to move your furniture around. And that is, for a lot of us, things become a habit, including addictive things or eating issues, you know, because I also work with that. Um, things become habits. So somebody comes home and they sit on the exact same place on their couch and they, you know, lean in a certain way and they, you know, uh, 
eats or they use their particular drug, so their drink of choice, they're this, they're that. Interestingly, if you move your furniture around and you can't kind of sit in the same comfy way or you, it doesn't kind of feel the same, it doesn't feel the same. And it's a little bit easier to notice that and then kick yourself to move on and not get back into that habit every day. So there's a lot of things like that. That's just one. Um, this has been shown to be more effective than most therapies. However, it can be challenging because it places significant demands on the patient who may have caused drug-related cognitive defects or deficits. So if the drugs have already caused cognitive problems that they can't change, this may not be your best option. Um, recent evidence shows, though, that it still seems to work. Maybe not as well, though, for people that have had that issue. Maybe there's something better out there. Um, we just haven't found it yet. So CBT is still one of the most widely used treatments. Now, pharmacotherapies, right? Study of dependence of the brain disease has focused research efforts on developing medications for treatment. Many experts believe that drugs alone will not cure chronic relapsing behavioral disorders. Okay, pharmacotherapies are helpful, but to be honest, they don't, they, they alone do not seem to work well to stop people that have chronic relapsing substance abuse issues. We need to deal with the issues that are underlying the use, not just put drugs on top of that. Now, pharmacotherapies, I think, are really helpful, though, because they can, like it says here, provide this window of opportunity for the treatments to work. If we can get somebody a little bit sober, um, not dealing with this terrible withdrawal symptoms, it gives us the opportunity to then work cognitive behavioral therapies. Now, when we do pharmacotherapies, there are different phases. First, we have the detoxification phase. This is initial and immediate. Medications are administered to alleviate unpleasant or dangerous withdrawal symptoms, right, that may appear following abrupt cessation of the drug. So stopping immediately. I've said this before. With alcohol, you need to go to the hospital for detox, for other things you don't necessarily, for some things you do. Um, some of these medications may also be used during maintenance. In the maintenance phase, this is a long-term strategy used to help a dependent individual avoid relapse, okay? Three general categories of pharmacotherapy for maintenance. We have agonist or substitution therapies, antagonist therapies, and punishment therapy. So our agonist or substitution induces cross-tolerance to the abuse drug. So giving methadone for heroin dependence or nicotine replacement for tobacco dependence, okay? An antagonist therapy prevents the user from experiencing the reinforcing effects, okay? So like a naltrexone blocks opioid effects. So if you're taking this drug, you now don't get the rewarding effects of an opioid. Um, same thing with like, um, there, there are ones for alcohol too. And then we have punishment therapy. And this produces adverse reactions following the ingestion of the abused drug. So the, the, the word you're probably more familiar with is antabuse, okay, for alcohol dependence. And that is you take the antabuse every day. You're committed to taking it. And then if you end up drinking alcohol, you vomit immediately or fairly immediately, okay? And then hopefully you won't keep drinking. Some people do. Some people are seriously addicted to alcohol. Okay, so let's talk about a few of the different drugs here. Alcohol detox, alcohol withdrawal syndrome, tremors, tachycardia, hypertension, insomnia, hallucinations, seizures. It's really dangerous. You need to be in an inpatient medical setting. 
Benzodiazepines are often used to reduce the autonomic hyperactivity and prevent seizures. The best choices are those with a slow onset of action. For maintenance, we can use the antabuse, causes those unpleasant symptoms if alcohol is consumed. Um, naltrexone reduces alcohol craving, rates of drinking. Um, the last one I'm not as familiar with, um, a camprostate um, normalizes basal GABA con concentration. Um, sorry, like I said, I'm not as familiar with this one. It was just recently approved, not too long ago. I don't really know anybody that's taken it. Um, so effectiveness really hasn't been determined anyway. The first two are, are used pretty commonly. Okay. Um, for nicotine, we have nicotine withdrawal, anxiety, depression, insomnia, nicotine replacement products, tons of stuff, the patch, gum, nasal spray, uh, the inhaler, the lozenges, absolutely shown to increase quit rate, okay? Um, success rates are probably lower in real world settings than in clinical settings, but still pretty good. Bupropion, which is Zyban, which is Wellbutrin. Wellbutrin is an antidepressant. If you want this medication for stopping smoking, we call it Zyban. If you want it for depression, we call it Wellbutrin. Same medication, exactly. Um, but it seems to work. A non-nicotine pharmacotherapy for smoking cessation, okay? Um, it seems to decrease cigarette craving and use. People seem to do better while using this or some of the other drugs that are similar to it. However, you have your detox phase, you get through the withdrawal symptoms, you, you probably still need some cognitive behavioral therapy to make sure you don't relapse later, okay? And we talked about that in the, the tobacco section, okay. Opioids, historically anticholinergic drugs like belladonna were used to treat dependence. Um, basically, it would just make people delirious so they don't remember what happened. However, more recent versions of this rapid opioid detox um, has been available to dependent people or given anesthesia and then given this opioid antagonist, it causes immediate withdrawal. The person is released after 24 hours and then should go to counseling while continuing to take some sort of opioid antagonist, okay? There are medical risks with this kind of withdrawal process, um, and unfortunately, those behavioral aftercare is often not emphasized enough, and so people relapse. Um, more things here, withdrawal symptoms include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, aches, pains, methadone for opioids, is a long-acting opioid agonist. Some people don't like it because they think, well, I'm just going to still be addicted to something, so what's the difference? The difference is this is not illegal and you're not shooting it into your vein. Um, we also have this other um, buprenorphine. Um, anyway, I don't know why I just said that weird. Um, a partial long-acting opioid agonist. Maintenance. Methadone maintenance is the most common form of treatment, okay, and they continue for months or years. Fewer data are available on more recently approved um, uh, buprenorphine. Buprenorphine, thank you. Um, but I've heard people that have had success with it, okay. Um, antagonist therapy, so we have our naloxone. This is a short-acting opioid agonist, and it's used to treat opioid overdose. And then we have our naltrexone, which is a long-acting opioid antagonist. Um, it's given like once per month um, sometimes, but um, typically it's given more often than that. Cocaine, withdrawal symptoms, depression, nervousness, anhedonia, fatigue, irritability, sleep disturbances, craving for cocaine. Risk of relapse may be greatest during the withdrawal period because people are like, this sucks, and I know if I just use, I'll feel better. 
immediately feel better. Right? It's like, that would be really, really difficult. So, um, reduced monoamine neurotransmitter activity may underlie these withdrawal symptoms. Medications that increase monoamine neurotransmitter activity have been tested. They haven't really been found useful in treating withdrawal symptoms or dependence. So there's no approved pharmacotherapy for cocaine dependence at this time. Um, cannabis. There are people that say that they have withdrawal symptoms from very, very regular high dosage use of um, marijuana. Irritability, anxiety, sleep disruption, aches. Um, there's no current pharmacotherapy for cannabis dependence. Um, some medications seem to be a little bit helpful. Um, really, you just have to kind of move through it if this happens to you. You don't need to go to the hospital, by the way. Okay. 97% uh, of treatment is for five drugs. Alcohol, opioids, marijuana, cocaine, and stimulants. Average age of those who admit it is 34. 57% uh, of people are treated as outpatients, 20% treated in hospitals, inpatient detox, 17% in residential settings, 6% in medication-assisted opioid programs. Substance abuse treatment development should focus on more effective interventions for commonly abused drugs. Treatment delivery as an outpatient basis, okay? Um, if you are interested in going into this type of work, um, a lot of people do it. People at UAB here do it um, in a lot of different departments. Um, my husband actually does research in, um, I guess, addictions, smoking cessation, and other things um, over in the Department of Public Health. So that's always an option to go that route. Uh, effective outpatient behavioral psychosocial interventions are needed to improve the overall success of treatment. We need some more, we need help here, guys. Um, we need some more treatment strategies. So is it effective? Substance dependence is a chronic illness. Treatment doesn't work for every individual every time. Um, condition may require continuing care throughout your life. Studies show that treatment is cost effective. One study showed a seven to one benefit in cost um, ratios. Reduces crime, it increases employment. And of course it saves lives, right? So is it effective? Yes. Is it effective enough? I don't think so. But um, we need to work on this. So similar to prevention efforts, uh, you know, this is where I make my plea to all of you taking this class and your friends and everybody is to, you know, maybe go into this field, maybe figure this stuff out, um, and then let me know when you have, all right? Okay, so that's all I have to say for this chapter, and um, hopefully you are getting studying for your final. Let me know if you have any questions.